school. This morning, I've titled my message, Prep Work. Um, there's an outline in your Bible if you'd like to follow along. And Prep Work. And I put this picture up, it looks like somebody who's drywalling. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I hate to drywall. I'd rather have my teeth pulled out than have to drywall. I hate activities and jobs that require a lot of prep work. Why? Because I'm impatient. And with drywalling, yeah, you nail up the drywall or you screw it in or whatever. That part I like. But then you got to put the mud in and you got to put the tape over and then you got to let it dry and then you got to sand it. Then you got to mud it again. If it's me, you got to mud it about four times and sand it again. And then there's this pile of dust all over the floor because you're like me and you don't know what you're doing. Prep work is important, though, if we're doing anything. If you're going to be staining wood, you have to prepare the wood before you can stain it. If you're going to be doing different things, you have to prepare it before you can do it. If you're sweating copper piping, you have to prepare it before you can sweat it. Right, Dan? Right, absolutely. So we're going to talk about Paul's prep work this morning as we are... Uh, as we are looking in the book of Galatians. So as I said, we're going to continue on our, on our uh, journey through the, Paul's letter to the church in Galatians. So take your Bible, if you will, turn it to Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 24. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's Bibles in your pew. And as always, I'll have all the scripture up on the screen as we go along. Now, before we get in, it's been two weeks since we've been in Galatians, so I just want to remind you, now, Paul writes this letter to the churches in Galatia because this is after Paul's first missionary journey. This is after Paul's first journey, and we look at the map here and we see that he visited all these churches in southern Galatia, which is now part of modern-day Turkey, and he has now returned to Antioch in Syria, and he's written a letter to the churches because he's found out that there's a problem. Some individuals have come in who call themselves Judaizers and started telling the people, who these people are Gentiles, Paul was preaching to, they weren't Jews, and these people came in and said, well, you can't be a Christian until you're a Jew first. You've got to become Jewish, then you can become a Christian. And Paul's like, what on earth is going on here? And these individuals who came in were questioning Paul's authority, and they were saying that Paul was giving a message that was of himself and not a message from God. So this is where Paul responds to all those things. And Paul is talking about how his authority comes from God and not from man. So we're going to read this passage as we go along. And my first point this morning is this. Three years later. Ver look at verses 18 and 19. Now, remember, Paul is talking about after he got saved. After Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, struck him blind. He was blind for three days. And Ananias came and saw him, restored his sight. And now, Paul says this. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with with Cephas, and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Cephas is Peter, by the way. Three years later. How many of you have never realized that before? Paul gets saved as this amazing encounter with Jesus Christ, and we think, okay, now Paul goes out and starts preaching the gospel, right? Three years later later. Three years is a long time, isn't it? Three years later. What was he doing for three years? Well, I think there's a few things to observe here. Paul doesn't just rush into ministry. He tried just rushing into things, didn't he, when he was persecuting the church. But see, there was a lot Paul needed to process. There was a lot that Paul needed to understand. After that, then he met, went to meet with Peter. I wonder what he and Peter talked about. Paul's point is he didn't go see Peter so that Peter could instruct him on the message of the gospel. I'm sure that they spent 50 days going, isn't God great? Isn't Jesus awesome? And I'm sure Paul looked at Peter and said, talk to me about what it was like to walk with Jesus for three years. Isn't it interesting that all the apostles spent three years with Jesus learning before Jesus left them and they started their ministry? And Paul, after having his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, spent three years preparing before he went into ministry. He also saw James while he was there. We know that James was Jesus' half-brother, and 
was head of the church in Jerusalem at that time. Let's look at verses 20 and 21, and it says, Now, in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So Paul says, okay, listen, I'm telling you the truth. This is what I did, and then I went into the areas of Cilicia and Syria, okay? Now, why did he go there? Well, first of all, Paul's hometown of Tarsus was in Cilicia, in case you didn't know. And Paul declares, this is the truth of what I'm telling you. This is the truth. You need to understand the order of events here in my world. Now, why are these points important for Paul? Why are they important? Because he was being accused of not understanding the message of the gospel. And that he was preaching his own message and not the message that Jesus Christ preached. Paul is trying to communicate. The message that I received, I received from the Lord. As he was accused of his message coming from himself, he says, no. He spent pre three years preparing for ministry. I'm sure he spent a ton of that time combing over the Old Testament, all those passages of the Old Testament that he knew and that he had memorized, all those Old Testament stories and all these things, and he starts to see Jesus in all these things. And I'm sure he spent a lot of time in prayer, seeking the Lord's direction. And it was only after all of that time, then he went to Jerusalem to meet with Peter. He was not there to be taught by Peter. I think he was there for camaraderie with Peter and encouragement with Peter and to share also with Peter what God has done for him. I'm, I imagine Peter wanted to know, man, what happened? You're this guy who was persecuting the church. What happened? Tell me all about it. I'm sure it was an amazing story for Peter to hear. So then we get to my next point. From infamous to unknown. Verses 22 through 24 say this. Paul says, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. You see, after his work against the church was so well known and publicized, Paul's early work for Christ was relatively unnoticed. So he was this infamous guy who, was, who all Christians were afraid of, and they, know, they knew that he was given papers and orders from the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem to go to these other communities and arrest these Christians and take them back to Jerusalem. Paul was very infamous amongst Christians. But then he disappeared. And even as he started doing things for Christ, people really weren't hearing it. He went from an infamous person to, for, to an unknown person for a while. You see, we learned something here from Paul, that as we work for Christ, we do not look for fame or recognition. And Paul sets a great example on this. You see, as people heard about Paul's conversion, they were probably very skeptical at first. We hear about this all the time. Such and such celebrity has come to know Christ, and we go, really? And then after a while, we see whether it's true or not, whether it's genuine or not. One of my favorite celebrities who, who follows Christ today is Alice Cooper. Everybody under the age of 20 is going, who? Who's that? Alice Cooper was a really nasty person. But to hear that man speak today and to hear his testimony is just amazing. Look it up sometime. Alice Cooper, very famous rock musician. They were skeptical of Paul's conversion. Really, this guy who's persecuting the church, now he's a Christian? They had good reason to be skeptical, didn't they? And they probably said, well, why don't you see if he's changed? Because I'll just stay over here and you go seek out this Paul dude and see if he's any different. But then they didn't hear anything about Paul for a very long time. But then word started to spread about Paul's ministry. And Paul says believers started praising God for Paul. God was glorified, not Paul. They didn't go, wow, that Paul, he's such an awesome guy. Look at how he's changed. They said, no, look at what amazing, how amazing our God is that we serve. 
that he was able to transform a man like Paul. Which brings me to this idea. Why we do what we do. Why do we do what we do? Well, let's look at verse 24 again. What did Paul say? And they were glorifying God because of me. That's it in a nutshell right there. Did you catch it? They were glorifying God because of Paul. You see, after Paul received Christ as his Savior and Lord, everything changed about him. His theology, his priorities, his perspective on Christ, his perspective on his own past, his perspective on life, his perspective on the Jews, his perspective on the Gentiles. All that changed once he encountered Jesus Christ. We talked about the communion table keeping our perspective. Well, for Paul's life, that moment when he met Christ, his whole perspective changed because of that encounter. You see, Paul had a new mission in life. Paul finally understood Jesus is the Messiah. Paul was committed to spreading the good news of the gospel above all costs. But here's the interesting thing. The one thing that didn't change about Paul, I firmly believe, the one thing that didn't change about him is his motivation. You see, when Paul was persecuting the early Christian church, he felt he was doing it for God. He felt God was being blasphemed by this false Messiah named Jesus. But once his eyes were open to the truth, his motivation and his passion multiplied. There was no greater message for Paul to communicate than the gospel message. The Messiah had come. The Messiah, who he had learned about from the time he was a little boy and read about as he studied the Old Testament, the Messiah really had come. And through his love and his grace, he has made the way of salvation for all mankind. Paul had to communicate this truth. And Paul's mission, as we see here, was to bring glory to God. Now, there are many places where Paul reiterates that. I want to share a couple with you. In Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, look what he says. He says, For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause what? The giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Paul says, All that we are doing as we share the good news of Jesus, as you guys work, and as you serve the Lord, and as you continue to spread the gospel message, what happens? God is glorified. Look what Paul says to the church in Rome. He says, For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles, who Paul was preaching to in Galatia, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. You see, Paul had this objective. As I tell people about God's love, as I tell people about, the, about Jesus Christ and that he is our Messiah and that he has come and he has died for us, Paul says, my objective here is that God is glorified. Friends, we are instruments of God's glory. We have been created to glorify God. We glorify God by spreading the good news of the gospel. We glorify God by living honorably for his glory. And we glorify God by giving him credit for everything that is in us that is good. Everything that is in us that is worthy, we recognize that it is all from God. And God is glorified through that. We come to the communion table for perspective of how much God loves us. But that perspective should bring a response. You see, Paul's perspective changed, and his response was, i got to tell people about this. Our perspective as we come to the table and as we're reminded of how much God loves us is God deserves all the glory. Amen? Amen. We need to glorify him with all that we are, and we need to follow Paul's example of bringing glory and honor to God. Would you stand with me as we close our service? I want to borrow Paul's words from 2 Thessalonians, and I pray this for you. To this end, I pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of the Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord 
Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day today.